and there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. One man, one microphone, one mission, one message. True News, the only newscast reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And now for the most powerful hour on radio, here is End Time Newsman, Rick Wiles. This is True News, the news program that reports the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help us God. I'm Rick Wiles. Welcome to one hour of uncensored news, views, and commentary. Professor Stephen Halbrook will be here in several minutes to talk about gun control in Nazi Germany and how it could happen again. Later in the program, Roger Stone will unload with some red-hot accusations about who he thinks really was behind the murder of JFK. You don't want to miss that interview. Now the news. President Obama is denying that he ever promised the American people that they can keep their existing health care plan if they like it after Obamacare takes effect. Numerous videos circulating on the Internet show Mr. Obama repeating the same statement over and over. If you like your health care plan, you can keep your health care plan. One video compilation features Mr. Obama making that pledge 29 different times. Speaking to supporters in Washington yesterday, Mr. O claimed that Americans could keep their health care plan if it hasn't changed since Obamacare was passed. His supporters cheered loudly. Now, let me ask you, who are you going to believe, Mr. Obama or your lying ears? He said he didn't say it, so that's it, right? Meanwhile, First Lady Michelle Obama hosted a festival in the White House today in honor of a Hindu goddess. The Festival of Lights, known as Diwali, is celebrated by Hindus to honor Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth. Hindus leave their windows open on this day so the little goddess can enter their homes. Mr. Obama issued a statement saying that the flame of the diva reminds us that light triumphs over darkness. Mr. Obama said he and Michelle have participated in the holiday both in the White House and in India. Mr. O commended the U.S. Congress for having the first Diwali celebration on Capitol Hill. That's because... Texas Republican Senator John Cornyn and Virginia Democratic Senator Mark Warner introduced a resolution in Congress recognizing the Hindu goddess and the celebration of Diwali. Mr. Obama, as you most of you know, reportedly carries a Hindu monkey god idol called Hanuman in his pocket. Mr. O is uh, planning to offer Iran a substantial cash incentive to talk nice Yesterday, tens of thousands of Iranians marched in Tehran streets shouting death to America. That doesn't matter to Mr. O. Maybe it does. Maybe that's what he's paying them for. The Times of London reported that the U.S. and Western nations will reward Iran with cash if they start acting like they might sign an agreement to stop developing nuclear bombs. Depka.com reported that Russia wants a naval base in Egypt. The commander of Russia's GRU military intelligence agency recently visited Cairo. His visit prompted Secretary of State John Swiftboat Kerry to make immediate changes to his travel plans and stop over in Cairo on his way to Riyadh to salvage America's ties with Saudi Arabia. Depka said Mr. Kerry saw from his plane the buildup of Russian warships in the Mediterranean The Russian naval fleet moved in quickly into the Mediterranean, took control after Mr. O backed down and didn't attack Syria. Russian warships are now present opposite Cyprus, Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Egypt, Suez Canal, and Libya. Mr. Putin is also calling the shots in Geneva regarding Syria. Diplomatic talks are underway this week in Geneva to pave the way for a Syrian peace summit. Uh... The Russian foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, said today that Iran must be invited to the peace talks. 
And that demand most likely will derail the possibility that the Syrian peace talks will start this month. Russian news agencies reported that two Russian nuclear bombers that had been patrolling the Caribbean and Central America have left the region and flown back to Russia. With little fanfare, Secretary of State John Kerry signed in late August the United Nations Arms Trade Treaty. The U.S. Constitution requires the U.S. Senate to ratify international treaties, but Mr. Kerry signed it anyway without ratification in order to signify to the United Nations that the Obama administration is on board with the agenda to establish a global regime to regulate the trade, ownership, possession, and use of small arms. Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid has not yet scheduled a date when the treaty will come to the Senate floor for a vote. A growing number of senators, however, both Democrat and Republican, have announced their opposition to the treaty. The most recent person is Tennessee Republican Senator Lamar Alexander. He said last week the treaty violates the Second Amendment right of American citizens. He said the treaty will threaten America's sovereignty because it allows the U.N. to amend the treaty later without further ratification by member nations. Other senators who announced Opposition recently to the treaty include Montana Democrat Max Baucus, North Dakota Democrat Heidi Heitkamp, Montana Democrat John Tester, and Indiana Democrat Joe Donnelly. I've been reporting since 1999 on this movement inside the U.N. to enact a global gun control treaty. This is the closest it's ever come to reality. In fact, it is reality now. A number of nations have have ratified it. It's uh, the United States that everybody's watching to see if it gets ratified here in America. I believe it is a crucial plank in the plans of certain people and entities for future world governance. An armed citizenry is a serious impediment to global governance, so they have to deal with with that problem first. A study of history reveals the dangers of of allowing tyrants to disarm the public. Dr. Stephen Halbrook is on the telephone with me right now. He has taught legal and political philosophy at George Mason University, Howard University, Tuskegee Institute. He's the author of numerous books, including Gun Control in the Third Reich. Professor Halbrook, welcome to Tree News. Thank you for having me, Rick. My pleasure to be on the show. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, well, this, uh, as I said in the in the introduction, I, I've been following this this uh, UN treaty uh, since 1999 when we went on the air with this radio program, and uh, back in '99 and 2000, a lot of people thought that'll never happen. They will never have a global gun control treaty. But it it has now happened. It's been ratified by the UN. It's been ratified by by many nations. And uh, for all practical purposes, it is in effect now. It's, the question is, will the UN, United States ratify it? Um, from a political viewpoint, do you think there's any any possibility the U.S. Senate could be com- could be persuaded to ratify this treaty? I think it's very doubtful. I think it's dead on arrival in the Senate. But the danger is that the Obama administration rules by executive decrees when it cannot get what it wants through uh, Congress. And another danger with this treaty is that it disrupts international trade in arms so that even if the U.S. Senate rejects it, uh, we import firearms from other countries. We export firearms to other countries. There are many legitimate law-abiding citizens in different countries in in Europe and in Asia, uh, Latin America, and Africa, and uh, to um, f- for basically, <laughs> if you think about the, who who are the ones in the UN voting for this, it's not just some of the democratic states; it's also various tyrannies throughout the world. Mm-hmm. Um, they'd be glad not to have any ability of their populations getting what they call small arms, which, by the way, includes not just military weapons but um, normal firearms that one would keep for self-defense or for hunting or for sporting purposes. So so rifles, shotguns, and pistols, revolvers are, are included in the treaty? Absolutely. This is not about military small arms. This is about all firearms. So the danger here is that 
with uh, numerous nations around the world ratifying the treaty and implementing it, there will be a disruption of weapons, ammo, and parts for weapons that could be imported to the United States. That's right. It could mean uh, a disruption of international trade in, in legal firearms. We're not talking about guns that come from North Korea to go to hot spots that don't have serial numbers and all that. We're talking about the legitimate firearms trade or industry worldwide. Um, Italy and Germany and uh, countries like that, they produce highly um, developed firearms for, for hunting, for sporting use, for uh, defensive use. And um, U.S. companies export guns to those same countries. But uh, it's, it's just a way to make things more difficult. Mm-hmm. And we've already seen the Obama administration restrict the importation of, of um, surplus American weapons that were used in other nations, and those nations want to um, sell them back to the United States to gun uh, dealers. And, and, and now the Obama administration has made that illegal. Right. We're talking about M1 Garand rifles from World War II. Uh, Obama said he's going to get them off the streets. Well, I can tell you there's probably never been an M1 rifle used in a crime in recent history. Uh, these are mainly for collectors. You know what? This reminds me, in, in my book I do have a discussion, in, um, the book Gun Control in the Third Reich. When the Nazis came to power, they severely restricted imported arms to their own country. They didn't want their own population to, to get firearms, and, and in particular... Uh, they had restrictions against handguns. The in- interior minister, Wilhelm Frick was his name, um, was responsible for signing executive orders. Uh, and-, and they did rule by executive order, by the way, and that was one of the unfortunate legacies of the Weimar Constitution, that, uh, that there could be um, the parliament, the uh, Reichstag could be bypassed and the executive department could rule by decree. And that was supposed to be for emergency purposes. But then when the Nazis took over, everything was an emergency purpose. And one of those decrees had to do with excluding uh, firearms, in particular handguns, from being imported. Uh, and the other big change was the Weimar Republic had... Um, they thought that the solution to political violence that was going on between communists and Nazis was to require law-abiding people to register their guns. And they warned, though, that these records should not fall into their own hands, the hands of radical elements. Well, guess who took power just, you know, a couple of years after the registration scheme was passed? It was the Nazis. And the first thing they did was to disarm all the people who were opponents of Nazism. They had the records, the blacklist on who their political opponents were, and they had the registration records to know who had guns and who, who had permits or licenses for guns. And so we're witnessing a repeat of the same thing happening here in the United States. Well, I think um, there's historical parallels here. There's no question. And I'm not one to to loosely use the word Nazi or to call people who I disagree with Nazis. I mean, that's uh, that cheapens the word, and the word needs to be reserved for the historical context that it arose in. Um, but we we do see the same kinds of overwhelming governmental powers being asserted uh, that that actually you've seen in a number of countries, both recent and old, um, where they they just get too much power. We've got the social engineers who think they know best for everybody. Um, That's not what, what a Republican form of government is all about or a democracy. That means a substitution of the choices of those who rule mm-hmm. for the for the citizenry, and that's just what we see in one issue after another, whether it's gun control, Obamacare, or any of those issues. In the early days of the Nazi regime, uh, as they were just solidifying their power, they were in uh, a. a um, a mortal fight with the Communist Party. It was the National Socialist Party versus the Communist Party for control of Germany. And uh, if the Nazis would not have uh, taken it, most likely the, the, the Communists would have, have taken control. And so it was uh, really a fight between uh, the Socialists and, and the Communists. Um, what what were some of the tactics in the early 30s that 
that Hitler and the Nazis used to persuade the German people that they needed to register their guns and eventually surrender their guns? Well, actually, they were already registered under the Weimar laws. There was a law in 1928 on firearms, and then there was the registration decree from 1931. This was a, a liberal democratic government, and they they had the same debates then as we have now on gun control, like uh, those who wanted to do something about the political violence between the communists and Nazis said, well, let's, let's require registration of guns so we'll know who has them. The opponents of that said that would be fruitless. It would be only the law-abiding people who would register their guns, and they're not doing anything wrong. And so when the Nazis came to power, lo and behold, they had all the records. They were all ready to go. And I've actually found archives where they would go down the list of individual people with gun licenses, and a police official or a Nazi would decide, is this person politically reliable to Nazism or not? And they would cancel the licenses uh, if they were not considered absolutely reliable. And this happened in 1933. In the same time, you have um, a vast propaganda effort to, to make it look like... Um, the country was going to be overthrown by the communists. You had the Reichstag fire, which the Nazis blamed on a communist setting that fire. A lot of people think the Nazis themselves did it. And then you have the abolition of the other political parties, labor unions. You have actions against the churches. All of that in 1933 to set up a totalitarian regime. And then in 1938, five years later, is when they really turned their attention against the Jews. And, and we have the total disarming of the Jewish population based on registration records, uh, registration records that went back to the Weimar era. And then we have the Night of the Broken Glass in which the Nazis attacked Jews in their homes and businesses. They burned the synagogues and just a complete um, pogrom against the Jewish people, also known as uh, Reichskristallnacht. So they certainly the Nazis made use of these records. and It's phenomenal to me why Historians basically have never gone into this subject to any any degree, whatever. Um, and uh, I don't know whether it's just. Uh, well, it's very it's very chilling. To, it's very chilling to think that that the the German government used the gun registration list to make decisions based on the political affiliation or or the leanings of the individual citizens. And that that gun licenses were were revoked when Nazis Nazi political operatives uh, dis, dis, decided that that person could not be trusted to to support the Nazi Party. That's a frightening the thought. That was so under the law that existed that was inherited from the Weimar Republic was that it it had phrases in it like a person cannot have a gun uh, if they're a danger to the state or an enemy of the state. They used vague language like that. And so when the Nazis came to power, they said, aha, we think all social Democrats are a danger to the state. We're going to cancel their gun permits. And that's exactly what they did. And the, the phrase enemy of the state actually meant an opponent of the Nazi party. That's right. I mean, the, the, the state, who is the state? Is it the people? Is it the government? Is it, is it a party that took power recently, well, that, it was the, the last choice is the way that was interpreted. So that, that's a problem with discretionary licensing involving gun owners, um, that if you, if you allow public officials to decide who gets to, the right to keep and bear arms, then they can arbitrarily decide um, who that is based on their own criteria. And then they can use phrases like, you're an unsuitable person, or you're uh, an enemy of the state, or whatever the phrase allows. Or mentally in unstable. Because that, that seems to be the latest tactic here in the United States. We're, we're going to label people as mentally unstable, and they're going to have to surrender their guns. Um, just recently, uh, there was this case of the, the, the Washington Times reporter uh, yes. who had a SWAT team uh, visit her home. And uh, they confiscated uh, they confiscated her husband's firearms, but they also confiscated her 
journalistic investigations on on government officials, and they used they used a what was it a 1986 conviction on her husband as as the reason that um, that the SWAT team was allowed to come in. They they said uh, I guess this is under in the state of Maryland that under Maryland's new tough. Uh, stringent gun control laws that went into effect this year that um, that if you had prior convictions you, you could not have a gun and and so this guy this the, the husband of this reporter had some minor conviction going back to 1986 and so they raided their home took his guns but what they were really looking for was her investigations on government officials and that well, just that, happened that, a couple weeks ago yeah that's the danger where we have militarization of law enforcement um there's been cases uh, i know this happened in washington dc where a veteran called a a hotline just to talk to somebody because he was depressed and they sent a swat team out to his place and and confiscated his guns um the law is clear that they, they can only prohibit a person from having a gun if if you're like a convicted felon or you've been um, committed to a mental institution involuntarily. But then when you start uh, allowing these rubbery definitions to come in where, for example, the VA uh, declared a lot of veterans um, who could not handle their own financial affairs as disqualified to own guns. They're not a danger to themselves or others. That should be the only criteria. Um, So we've seen a a tendency to use these other, I would call, rubbery criteria to uh, allow, by their own discretion, government officials to deprive people of firearms. And so that's that's the historical danger. If you look at history, it's always been when you have you get closer to uh, a government that's ruled by the few, they want to control the people, they control access to to arms back in those days that would be bows and arrows and swords in ancient times uh all the way up to modern times and then it's firearms and in societies that are freer like our own traditionally we've had a right to keep and bear arms that's what why the second amendment exists it's to allow the people to defend themselves from criminals and tyrants and invaders and all the rest so uh, what we're talking about here are historical lessons. There are unique, very unique aspects of the Nazi regime, uh, the fact of the Holocaust, um, historical phenomena like that, that uh, there are comparable events that have happened in the world, but I'm, I'm not attributing these kinds of events mm-hmm. to our own society just because we have um, – Gun laws, in some cases, that that are out of control. I, I want to talk. I want to talk about the disarming of the Jews in Germany. Uh, very few people know anything about this. Um, how how well armed were the Jewish people in Germany in 1930s? Nobody knows, but I can tell you one thing: there were a lot of Jewish veterans of World War One who served honorably in the war. And they, they, when the armistice came along, a lot of the German armies just walked away. They took their arms with them. And we know that in, lo- in a lot of these searches and seizures of Jewish houses in 1938, um, they were confiscating rusty revolvers and rusty bayonets and swords. So, first of all, you had a lot of these veterans who had their own arms. And then you, also the German Jews were very assimilated into German society. They... they they were hunters. They had guns for self-protection, just like other Germans. And in my book, I've got numerous accounts of Jewish gun owners. Um, <clears throat> one of them was the head of the what was called the Jewish Central Association, which was the organization, umbrella organization of all Jewish organizations in Germany. And in October of 1938, he recorded how, uh, when the co- guns were being confiscated from Jews, he had a new Browning gun he had to turn in. So um, we know that it happened. We don't know. We, we don't know how many guns are in the U.S. now. Much less can we ever know. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know do, what, do you course. do you think do you think that uh, had the Jews resisted and not surrendered their guns, that there would not have been a Holocaust? I'm not going to make any historical claim like that, but mm-hmm. I will say that the Nazis themselves thought it was extremely important to disarm their political opponents 
and, and selected groups who they hated, like the Jewish people. And um, it was not illegal until 1938 for a Jew to own a gun in Germany, but in 1936, a top official in the Gestapo, Werner Best, drafted a memo to all police departments saying that Jews are a danger to the German people, and it would be rare cases indeed when they should ever be given a gun permit. And finally, after you have the confiscation of the guns of Jews in October of 1938, based partly on the registration records, and I've got police reports to document that, um, when the Night of the Broken Glass occurred, November 6 to 7, 1938, Heinrich Himmler, the SS chief, issued a, a decree saying that if a Jew has a gun, it's 20 years in a concentration camp. That's the penalty. And at the same time, they arrested probably over 20,000 Jewish men in the night of the broken glass. So they didn't want any resistance. In one, uh, in one night, 20,000 Jewish men were arrested in one night. It would probably be over a course of two days or maybe three days. That's what they ended up with, over 20,000. And then, of course, they held them hostage until they would pay. They would pay money to get out. And then they made the Jewish community pay for the damage that the Nazis themselves did. Is the night of the broken glass. So it was, the entire war against the Jews had to do a lot with not simply some theoretical prejudice, but had to do with expropriating their property. It was a way to take property, to demonize one group of people to take their property away. And that's exactly what was accomplished. The lucky ones got out. The unlucky ones did not. And what I find fascinating about this is that, is that you're saying that it, it was not illegal for Jews to own guns in Germany until 1938. So from 1938 to 1944, 45, roughly a 67-year period, is when you had the, the, the makings of the Holocaust, where millions of Jews were, were, were slaughtered. It, it, was, it happened in a very compressed period of time directly after it became illegal for a certain group of people to own firearms. Well, when you when you raise the the subject of the Holocaust, we're also talking then about the Nazis invade, invading other countries like like Poland and France, for example. And in those countries, instantly when the invading force came, they put up posters saying that if you don't turn in your guns within 24 hours, you'll get the death penalty. I've seen actual posters like that. I've I've seen copies of or reports of them in a number of records and newspapers of the time. And so in, in Poland, for example, you got the death penalty if you were either a Pole or a Jew in possession of a firearm, um, and the, or if you knew about another person who had a firearm and you didn't tell the authorities, you could get the death penalty. So things were even worse once the war started and the invasions began. Uh, it became a question of who can we ferret out to, to seize their guns, and in France, you had, under the armistice, the French government took over the duties of administering the occupation. In other words, the German army would give all orders and the French police would enforce them. So you had the French police with their own registration records the, going after the gun owners in France, uh, some of whom turned them in and some of whom simply hid them. So, so, so in, this, in France, the uh, a good portion of the French government structure actually cooperated with the Nazis once uh, the Nazis invaded uh, France. That's right. They, they collaborated. That was actually the terms of the French surrender or the armistice uh, that they would administer the country. So the, the Wehrmacht, the German army, would give the orders, and the French police would go execute them. And I've, I've got a lot of internal records where the Germans were praising the French police for the, their excellent cooperation but these records also complained about how one of the ways the, the French are in the most violation of our decrees is that the, many of them will not turn in their guns. The, the one thing that I'm hearing out of your words is how fast it can change. How, this can change in, in a very short period of time. And suddenly you have 24 hours to surrender your guns or you face a death penalty. Uh, in those kind of situations, uh, uh, fear ruled the day, and people had to right. make a decision, life or death, whether they're going to keep their firearm. Right, and, and you have, uh, on the one hand, 
for those who the, the Germans knew a lot of people did not surrender their guns, and that created uncertainty. And so that in itself was an act of defiance that was, you know, one more out of an infinite number of things that would contribute to the defeat of Nazism. Just, just them knowing that people were out there without, uh, that had not surrendered their guns. So um, th- those, who, those who did cooperate, then obviously never got them back. Um, once you had resistance movements beginning in countries like France, they were always short of arms. I mean, you look at the, um, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, the, the Jews who revolted against deportations. It was quite a heroic deed that they, they did. They held the German army out of the ghetto for weeks. Um, propaganda Minister Joseph Goebbels had talked about, this shows what happens when Jews have guns. So they were quite defiant, and, and they, that saved lives. That was better than just going and being deported and going to the gas chambers, no matter what the result would be. Had there only been many Warsaw Ghetto uprisings, things would have been better. What, what changes, what events, what laws, what regulations in America would, would make you become very, very nervous that we're repeating the same sequence of events as Germany? Well, I think that would be if, if we no longer had the right to vote uh, or we could only vote for one candidate or we no longer had a right to engage in um, free speech like we're doing right this minute. Mm-hmm. Uh, if we're no longer having a free press, Guns are banned. All of these things normally go together as a bundle. And when, when, when that happens, the republic is collapsing, and that would be a time when th- that would be a qualitative leap. That That's not what we have now. And I think we have to there, – there's no justification, for example, for any individual using arms to resist the government at this time in history. Mm-hmm. Um, that would be insane. Our, our founders, the founding fathers, talked about a long chain of abuses. This was in the Declaration of Independence. The government would have to have um, a tendency to reduce the people to slavery before any kind of armed revolt would be justified. But that's the ultimate aim they had in creating the Second Amendment. They knew that that was their experience. That was what they had to do to get rid of the, the, the British colonial system. And this is a, a universal law throughout history that there comes a time when, when if a government becomes tyrannical, the, either you let it go, in which case you're not being a responsible citizen, or you take steps against it. With the power of the modern U.S. government and the, the news media uh, combined, working together, is there a possibility that we could have some type of event either authentic or or contrived event that could stampede the public into feeling compelled to surrender their guns oh i think that the that the second amendment right is so ingrained in the american people that you will not have large proportions of them doing that and you can look in, at states recently that have enacted stringent laws banning guns, like New York and Connecticut and California, and <clears throat> requiring that, that guns be registered. I, I would say there's probably a, a low proportion of people who actually abide by those laws. I, th- I think that the American people as a, as a whole would not stand for that. What I, what I do fear is, is the use of um, a monopolistic news media to based in conjunction with a, a nefarious government agenda to basically stampede people into um, giving up their democratic liberties. That, that's what happened in the early stages of Nazi Germany. Hitler was elected into power, and then that government created one incident after another and, and said that, well, to protect society, we have to take these measures. And, and you ended up with a police state. Isn't that what we're? Isn't that what's happening right now since nine eleven? Well, we've we've got a tendency in that direction, certainly, and we've got we're we're losing our liberties. That we've got the 
incredible shrinking Fourth Amendment, the right against unreasonable search and seizure. We have the government reading our emails and, and telephone logs. And so, you know, it's, at some point, it's got, the pendulum's got to swing the, back the other way. Mm-hmm. And the political correctness is so extreme now that that children in elementary school are being suspended if they make a pretend gun with their fingers. Right. We've seen several cases, like I said, the, the, the one who made the shape of a gun out of a cookie and and, and the, the kid who got suspended just for making his, his finger look like a pistol. But it's a, prop- I mean, it's a propaganda campaign to, to demonize gun ownership. So that you right. so that you have a generation growing up that believes it is wrong. It is absolutely wrong to own a gun, and anybody who owns a gun must be a criminal. So if they keep that up, Professor, for another 10 years, we're going to have millions of people at the adult level voting in this country who actually think it is illegal to own a gun. Well, we've got a lot of people like that now, but on the other hand, we've got, as you think about state laws... Um, most states in this country don't have those kind of laws. A few of them do. And if you think about the U.S. Congress, we've seen the defeat of these kind of gun prohibition measures in recent years. Once we got past the Clinton presidency, there has been no further federal gun control laws that have passed. But we do have a president right now who is quite willing to use executive orders. He's very frustrated that that Congress wouldn't pass any any of his agenda. And so he, he can chip away. He can use his executive orders, like about importing the M1 rifles we were talking about, uh, but he cannot do anything to stop production of guns in the U.S., and he cannot stop U.S. consumers from buying them. And as you know, there's been more gun sales in the last – during the Obama administration than in U.S. history. He's been called the best gun salesman in existence. Well, at least he's, he has stimulated one sector of the U.S. economy. That's right. <laughs> um, one thing I've I've warned about for many years is the possibility that a George Soros, a, uh, you know, a Mayor Bloomberg, a, a group of billionaires use their money to buy up gun manufacturers and ammo uh, manufacturers and simply close the doors. Well, if that theoretically happened, you would have entrepreneurs opening their doors and creating new new production. And um, I, I don't know that that's never happened. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I think that's, but that's that a poss- a- that's a possibility that the, these guys could buy out uh, m- uh, gun manufacturers or at least. Um, uh, dry up the supply of ammo in the country. I mean, so you have a gun, but you don't have any ammo. Well, there's certainly been ammo shortages in recent times. That's right, and they could they could they could uh, create shortages of the of the materials needed to make the ammo, or they could make they could make it you know a federal fence to have those ingredients in your home. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of things that these people could do to make life very difficult for people trying to to maintain their Second Amendment right. And that's what I, you know, I believe we have to be on guard for, is that they're going to come at us at, from every angle imaginable. Right. Yeah, I agree. Pleasure, Rick, talking with you today. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I, I appreciate you coming on the program. Uh, my guest, Dr. Stephen Halbrook, his his uh, most recent book is Gun Control in the Third Reich. It's a book many of you will want to read. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Rick. Take care. Bye. Reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ, you're listening to True News, the End Time Newscast. This is Max McLean. Why does God discipline us? Listen to the Bible from Hebrews 12. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? 
Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good that we may share in His holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace. From Hebrews 12. Listen to the Bible. It's great for the soul. The 50th anniversary of the assassination of John F. Kennedy will be November 22nd. In this segment, you're going to hear explosive information about the Kennedy murder. I've waited all year for this book and interview. I first read about it at the beginning of the year, and when I read the name of the author, I knew I had to invite him on the True News. The book is The Man Who Killed Kennedy. The author is Roger Stone. Roger Stone is a longtime political consultant and strategist in the National Republican Party. He played important roles in the presidential campaigns of Richard Nixon, Ronald Reagan, and number 41, George Herbert Walker Bush. Mr. Stone was also deeply involved in the 2000 Florida recount when the election teetered between George W. Bush and Vice President Al Gore. Roger Stone, welcome to True News. Rick, great to be with you. Yes, sir. Well, let's get straight to the heart of your book. Uh, In your opinion, who was behind the assassination of President Kennedy? Well, the man with the the unique motive, means, and opportunity uh, is Lyndon Baines Johnson, his own vice president. Um, That does not mean that Johnson is the sole uh, plotter in the death of John F. Kennedy. I believe that that Lyndon Johnson yokes a conspiracy that involves uh, a number of other institutions or individuals that include the CIA, uh, their allies in organized crime, uh, Texas oil, and even military intelligence, all of whom have their own individual reasons why that why they need JFK out of the way. But Johnson's is the most immediate and the most desperate. In November of 1963, He is a man staring into the abyss. He knows that he will be removed from the 1964 ticket because both Robert and John Kenny have begun telling people that. But he also knows, more importantly, that uh, he is caught up in both the Bobby Baker and Billy Sal Estes uh, scandals of the day, enormous corruption scandals. Johnson's corruption was of biblical proportions. Um, He was dealing with suitcases of money. Uh, You could buy legislation by bribing him. You could get federal contracts by bribing him. Um, Really nothing moved in Washington without LBJ getting a piece. He was shameless. Um, And he knew that that Robert Kennedy's Justice Department had given uh, a uh, dossier to Life magazine, one of the big publications of the day, uh, and that they were planning to run a major expose on Johnson's financial wheelings and dealings on the Saturday after the assassination. That very day, November 22nd, the U.S. Senate opened hearings into the corruption of Senate Secretary Bobby Baker. Baker was described by Johnson as my strong right arm. He was, in fact, Johnson's errand boy and his bag man. So Johnson, who, who, uh, if you believe Robert Caro's four-volume biography, which has some good and some bad things about it, But the one thing Johnson could not tolerate was public humiliation and embarrassment. He was not only going to be embarrassed, he was going to prison. Uh, Roger, uh, participating in the planning and and implementation of an assassination requires that person to to be familiar with murder. Do Do you have any reason to suspect that LBJ was capable of murder? I have more than reason. I I actually, in my book, I tie him to at least eight individual murders prior to JFK. Well, that's more than Hillary Clinton. Yeah, it is, although my next book is probably going to be about that. Uh, I I think that he is responsible for a series of murders. Uh, Initially, he murders to cover up the electoral fraud and the theft of votes in the 1948 election, which he steals with 87 fraudulent votes. Then he kills to cover up corruption in the uh, in the uh, Billy Sal Estes case. He kills at least three government informants, or he orders them killed, I should say. Uh, he definitely uh, orders the killing of John Kinzer, a man who was blackmailing him, who was uh, sexually involved with Johnson's sister, Josepha, who was a notorious bisexual and party girl of the time. 
Uh, murder is in his ap- repertoire. Look, Lyndon Johnson is an amoral psychopath. Uh, forget this burnished image that the LBJ library is cranking out of Johnson as a great uh, proponent of civil rights. He was a ruthless, vicious, abusive, corrupt, uh, vindictive, uh, manic depressive, uh, who uh, went from deep, deep depressions to wild outbursts of temper. Um, he was uh, oversexed, having a uh, 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 fathered at least three illegitimate children, who I name in my book, two of whom are still living. Uh, he was often drunk. He had this great tendency after he became president to expose himself to people. Uh, you know, he, this is a guy who a Secret Service agent, quoted in my book, said, if he wasn't president of the United States, he would have been committed to a mental hospital. Wow. I never saw any of that in the campaign brochures. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, yeah. it's interesting. You, you take Robert Caro, who wrote a celebrated four-volume biography uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Johnson, and the portrait he paints is not undifferent than what I just said. He, he, he depicts him as a monster, as an ambitious, corrupt monster. My problem with Caro is he doesn't go the next step. So in four volumes, he devotes an enormous amount of space to the Bobby Baker scandal. Again, Baker was a secretary of Senate, was a Johnson bag man, ultimately went to prison. Uh, But he devotes not a word, not even a mention, to Billy Sal Estes. Now, I went back and I did the research. There are more column inches written on the Estes scandal than the Baker scandal at the time. So why is it that Caro chooses to ignore the Estes scandal? I'll tell you, because Billy Saul does his time. He goes to prison, and when he comes out, he goes to the grand jury, and he testifies uh, to Lyndon Johnson's long trail of murder. He also writes a letter to the Justice Department, which is in my book, in which he goes through the laundry list of individual murders for which he says Lyndon Johnson is responsible. So um, Caro, if he reported on the existence of Estes, would have to report on what I just told you, the grand jury testimony in the letter. And that lays bare the fact that Lyndon Johnson was a murderer. So Mr. Caro, he went for the fancy East Side cocktail parties. He went for the Pulitzer. He went for the money, but he didn't go for truth. It is intellectually dishonest. Is, is Robert there... Caro should be. He should be stripped of his Pulitzer. Stripped. Roger, is 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 there one particular uh, item that Mr. Caro refused to look at? Why isn't Estes mentioned? Go to the go to the uh, go to the uh, uh, the index of the books. Billy Saul Estes was a major figure in Johnson's life, and the scandal was a major factor in Johnson's life. But Estes came clear after prison, and he accused Johnson of murder. And Carroll just doesn't want to report that. Then secondarily, he ignores the existence of a man named Malcolm Mac Wallace. Uh, in the Texas School Book Depository Sniper's Nest, there are five fingerprints found by the Dallas Police Department. Four of them belong to Lee Harvey Oswald. I believe they have been planted there, although, although perhaps these are boxes he handled because he worked there. But one fingerprint is indisputably belongs to a man named Malcolm Wallace. Who is Malcolm Wallace? He's a convicted murderer who Lyndon Johnson has gotten a long succession of, of patronage jobs. He worked at the U.S. Culture, uh, Agriculture Department. I got his personal records recommended for the job by Lyndon Johnson. After he was convicted of murder... He was represented in the murder trial. He, oh, let me back up. He murdered a man named John Kinzer, who was involved with Johnson's sister. He went to trial. He was convicted. He was represented at trial by John Kofer, Lyndon Johnson's personal attorney. Hey, Mr. Carroll, how'd you, how'd you miss that? How did you miss the existence of Wallace? Then Wallace, upon his conviction, he gets a five-year suspended sentence for murder, which is easy to do if you're one of Lyndon Johnson's judges. And he immediately is hired for a defense contractor uh, called Temco, owned by D.H. Byrd, chairman of the Lyndon Johnson for Senate Finance Committee. H.D. Byrd owns the Texas School Book Depository. Oh, Matt Wallace killed eight people, nine if you include Kennedy, and he left a fingerprint to prove it. 
So I, 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 how does Robert Caro write four volumes and not mention Mac Wallace? Roger, like I have exists. never, I have never. Way, Wallace's conviction, Wallace's convictions on the front page of the Texas newspapers at the time. You can look it up. So Ro- Roger, of intellectually all, dishonest. Uh, and, Roger, and of, of all the interviews I've done through the years about Kennedy, I've never heard what you just said. Well, uh, if uh, if you go to the Texas newspapers at the time. Wallace's uh, uh, conviction is reported. The fact that he was involved with Johnson's sister is reported. Uh, Wallace's long employment record is reported. And in fact, after Malcolm Wallace murders John Kinzer in front of witnesses in broad daylight on a golf course, on a, on a mini golf course, he is apprehended. And according to the affidavit from the police officer who in, who arrested him, he says, "Let me get this quote exactly right: You can't arrest me. I work for Senator Johnson." Close quote. How did Robert Carroll miss this in his august biography? But I, I've never when, I've... when Douglas Caddy when Douglas Caddy, who was a Texas-based attorney, who represented Billy Sal confronted Caro himself in a public book signing. Caro turned white as a ghost. He refused to discuss it. Uh, and he said, give me your card. I'll call you. Of course, he never called. I will send Caro a registered letter. I'll make the letter public. It's time for somebody to expose this fraud. The man's a fraud. Well, you know, I'm, the I'm, money in the public. I'm still trying to, to uh, comprehend that you said that the Texas Book Depository was owned by Lyndon Johnson's Senate Campaign Finance Chairman. Yes, H.D. Byrd is a uh, is a very eccentric uh, oil billionaire. Uh, his cousin, Senator Harry F. Byrd, oh that Byrd family, is a close associate of Lyndon Johnson's. Uh, Byrd, Harry Byrd, refused to endorse John Kennedy for uh, for the presidency in 1960, even though. Byrd was a sitting Democratic senator from Virginia. He was the only member of the Senate Democratic Caucus who would not endorse JFK. Four years later, running against one of Harry Byrd's closest friends, Barry Goldwater, he stumped Virginia for Lyndon Johnson. There's a picture in my book of Lyndon Johnson kissing Harry Byrd's hand. They were very close allies. Harry Byrd, the reason this is important is because he's the chairman of the Senate Committee with Congressional Oversight over the CIA. Harry Byrd controls every penny of the CIA budget. Lyndon Johnson, when he was in the Senate, was on the committee. Lyndon and Harry founded the CIA, and they had congressional oversight. By the way, they're both also on the Senate Armed Services Committee, where Johnson's friend, Richard Russell makes decisions about who gets big defense contracts. Here's the upshot. Malcolm Wallace goes to work for Temco. His fingerprint is found in the, in the Texas School Book Depository. As soon as Lyndon Johnson becomes president, Temco is given a monstrous $4 billion defense contract. So H.D. Byrd got his payoff. Was there a Johnson connection to Jack Ruby? Most definitely. First of all, uh, Johnson was being paid $55,000 a month from the mob in Dallas from a guy, a mobster named Jack Halfer, who was a bag man for Carlos Marcello, who was the mob boss who controlled the mob in both Texas and Louisiana. Although Marcello operated out of New Orleans, Texas was his territory. So Johnson is on the is a recipient of mob monies. It is also important to note that as soon as Lyndon Johnson becomes president, all of the U.S. Justice Department wiretaps of organized crime figures are terminated by the new president. Uh, Ruby uh, had connections to Marcello. He is a Marcello uh, button man, low-level operative from the mob. Ruby is permitted to run his club. In, uh, in Dallas, he has to make payments to the organization himself. Uh, I detail in my book that uh, President Nixon believed that Oswald killed Kennedy because that's what J. Edgar Hoover told him until the moment that he saw Jack Ruby kill Lee Harvey Oswald, whereupon he turned to his aide, Nick Ruey. He turned white as a ghost and he said, I know that guy. 
Fast forward to 1985, I asked Nixon about the water, the uh, Kennedy assassination, and he said, and let me get this exactly right, the hell of the thing is, Nixon said, I knew this Ruby fellow, went by the name Rubenstein. He was one of Johnson's boys. Murray Shatner, who was a, Johnson, a, Kennedy, uh, pardon me, a Nixon aide, brought Ruby to me in 47, said Lyndon wanted us to put him on the payroll as a courtesy. And we did. Then I went to the FBI records, and indeed, I find the payroll records for Jack Rubenstein of Chicago. That's our boy, uh, who was a in paid informant for Richard Nixon's House Committee, a courtesy for his close friend Lyndon Johnson. And, and Remember, Richard Johnson and Nixon came to the house, came to the U.S. House at the same time. Richard Nixon personally said this to you. Correct, and then it's corroborated in the government documents of the day. Who who was responsible for the the bubble top being removed from the Kennedy limousine that day? Well, here's what we know: uh, Bill Moyers, who is uh, the liberal media uh, uh, talking head today, was then a an aide to Vice President Johnson. Also, as you may or may not know, Bill Moyers is a is an ordained minister. Um, uh, he goes, he Moyers goes to the Secret Service, and he says. The president wants this bubble top removed now. Well, funny talk for a uh, minister, but uh, Kennedy aides Jerry Bruno and uh, Kenny O'Donnell later testified to the Warren Commission that President John Kennedy gave no such order regarding the bubble top. I think we know who did give that order, don't you? It certainly sounds to me like Lyndon Johnson, but... I'll defer to Bill Moyers. He needs to answer the question. Mr. Moyers, you lied when you said the Kennedy, that the president wanted the bubble top removed. So who did give the order? I will dog Mr. Meyer, Moyers. I will go to his apartment in New York. I'll go to his studio. I'll go to his office. And I will badger him until he answers the question. See, I don't like sanctimonious liberals. I don't either. When this quiets down a little bit, will you come back on the program in a few weeks or a month or so when your schedule's a little bit lighter? We can we can actually do it sooner than that, if you like. Um, I am really uh, spending all my time trying to get the truth out and uh, obviously promote my ideas through this book. And I would be delighted to come on back with you if you want to contact my folks. I'm sure we can set that up in we, the very near future. We will. I've got a lot I want to ask you. Okay. Roger Stone, uh, the book is The Man Who Killed Kennedy, The Case Against LBJ. Um, I know our audience is going to pick up this book. This thing is, folks, we just talked, we've just touched the first layers of this book. There's a lot more that you need to hear. Thank you, Roger. We'll have you back on soon. Rick, I'm very grateful. Many thanks. As Roger Stone was talking, I was thinking about all the scriptures that promise that things done in this life in darkness will be brought to light by God in the day of judgment. That's a sobering thought for all of us to remember. Mark chapter 4, For there is nothing hid, save that it should be manifested, neither was anything made secret, but that it should come to light. 1 Corinthians Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will bring both to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart. Matthew 10, fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. Ecclesiastes 3, I said to myself, God will bring into judgment both the righteous and the wicked. For there will be a time for every activity, a time to judge every deed. Ecclesiastes 12, For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or or whether it be evil. In Romans 2, This will take place on the day when God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ. 